Hello everyone and welcome back to the It Matters podcast. Today's guest is a teaching assistant in neurosurgery at the Carol Davila University School of Medicine in Bucharest. He is a fourth year resident neurosurgeon at the Bucharest Emergency University Hospital, Romania's largest hospital focusing on neurosurgery as well as on neuroscience, neuro-oncology, neurogenetics and molecular medicine. During his time as a medical student, He was president of the student's chapter of the Society for Physicians and Naturalists in Iași, where, together with Professor Ion Poiata and Dr. Bogdan Iliescu, organized the Student Neurosurgical Organization, one of the most successful profile organizations in Romania. While his current activity and expertise is focusing on head and spine trauma, his endeavors and research generated seven papers in world-renowned journals, and approximately 50 papers in national journals. He's a peer reviewer for World Neurosurgery, Journal of Acute Diseases, and Journal of Translational Medicine and Research. He is currently working on receiving a patent in the field of surgical techniques. He's a member of AO Spine Europe, currently in the process of completing his PhD on failed spine surgery. Besides, he was a guest physician at the International Neuroscience Institute in Hanover and holds the Romanian Medical Association Prize for Promising Doctoral Research. He is a scale modeling enthusiast, a passionate guitar player with a high interest in the history of medicine and warfare, geopolitics and drawing. Other hobbies also include airsoft, sci-fi and he considers music to be the one thing he couldn't live without. So, please help me in welcoming the man who patented the discoveries regarding the hidden anatomy present in Michelangelo's paintings on the Sistine Chapel, Dr. Horatio Moise. Uh, hello and thank you so much for coming and for uh, accepting my invitation. Morning and thanks for having me. It's uh, half past nine here in Bucharest as we're recording this and I'm not the only one holding a patent in fact there are several publishers who who generated papers regarding the hidden anatomy Michelangelo's paintings I'm just simply carrying on their efforts and uh, well Yeah. If you read the paper, you'll find out. <laughs> I, I read the paper. It's, it's quite amazing. And I know, okay, you're carrying their work, but it's your work too. I mean, let's not put it like this. I understand there are several authors, but yeah. the article is, is, is so amazing. Uh, I want to start by asking you why you chose medicine and particularly why neurosurgery? Wow. Why, why medicine? Why neurosurgery? Um, okay, let me start by saying that... You don't choose neurosurgery, basically. N- neurosurgery chooses you. You have to be a special, ki- a special kind of madman to do this. Um, I remember I was in the 11th grade in high school. Uh, and our, uh, our coordinating professor came into the, the classroom one day and said, Okay, starting today, you need to focus on what you're going to do next. What will your future careers be? And by, uh, by tomorrow morning, I want you to come up with a list. So everyone had to come up with a list and say, well, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a fireman. I want to be um, a soldier. I want to be a policeman and so on. And I, uh, I went home that day, sat behind my desk and thought to myself, okay, what, what do I want to do in this life? Yeah, I know. Uh, in theory, it seems simple enough, but... You know, once you're alone with that piece of paper and you sit down and think about it, okay, you need to remember that you're in high school. You have no skills. You don't know what to do with your life. You're, yeah, that was my problem too. Okay. Yeah, your mom and dad are backing you up and they, they only say, okay, you need to learn and get big grades and uh, study and so on and you'll figure it out. And at a certain moment, you know, you need to figure it out. Of course you do. So, funny enough, My options, I, I remember and I started laughing, were uh, going into the military. We boys always dream of being in the special forces and so on. 
my second option was becoming a politician. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. And my third wow. option was uh, well, my third option had to do something with the documentary I've seen. It's called A History of Surgery and it's narrated by Michael Mosley. Uh, it's a part of it's a series of documentaries published by BBC regarding how history how uh, surgery came to be what we know it today. And uh, I sat behind that desk and said to myself, okay, so if I go and join the military, yeah, okay, it will be fine, it will be good, but, you know, the Romanian military always lacks something. If I become a politician, most likely I'll become, I'll, I'll, I'll end up behind bars. <laughs> so the, the reasonable option was to do something that would make an impact on the lives of people around me. And the community in general. I'm a I'm a communitarian, by the way. Um, we communitarians believe that all we have to do is just do something for the community we live in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a certain skill set, you need to pay back. Yes. You know, everyone around you with that skill set. Do something for the common good, and um, I chose medicine. Nice. So neurosurgery in particular um, was the common was the next question. Okay, you want to you want to go into medicine. Okay, what what branch, what specialty? And I said, okay, which one is the hardest? <laughs> Everyone around me was okay. You're crazy. No, don't don't do like don't don't think like that. I said, which one is the hardest? And basically, um, I came up with neurosurgery because it was the most complex, the most challenging. Um, it's a field of the future. Neuroscience is a field of the future. <coughs> and uh, the confirmation for having chose such a wonderful specialty came during the, the first summer practice in my first year. I was in Yash. I, I studied the first two years of med school in Yash. Oh, so you, you decided on neurosurgery from the first year of your... No, I decided on neurosurgery since the 11th grade. Oh, oh okay. So I didn't go to med school and choose something. I just went to med school to become a neurosurgeon. And uh, I remember during the first summer practice in Yash, I, uh, I met this wonderful guy. His name is Cezar Popescu. He's currently the uh, chairman of the Romanian Society for Spine Surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of identified with him. You, you have to remember, I'm, I was a first year med school student. Uh, I had no idea what planet I was on. I, was, I, I, I barely knew that there are 206 bones in the body. Okay, <laughs> Never mind the muscles. And you need to imagine this think this small creature entering your surgical service and, and saying okay i want to be a neurosurgeon so he was the only one who he the only one who didn't laugh i said okay so um we became friends okay we initially had a teacher to pupil mm -hmm. relationship and during those three weeks of summer practice I think I read the entire anatomy of the human body as a hobby. So in the morning I was in the hospital, uh, watching from the sides as these gods operated on the human spine. And in the evening I went back home and started reading more and more and more and more. So towards the end of, the, of this three week period, I remember they were operating on a cervical spine. Um, they were extracting a C, C5, C6 cervical hernia. And in that operating theater, there were about four or five residents. All They, they were all high years in the fifth or sixth year. Mm -hmm. And I was the smallest, you know, I was, a, I was a medical student. And at a certain point, the... The surgeon, Cesar Popescu, says, okay, what is this? And I was the only one who knew. That was Chassinex to Burkle. <laughs> yeah. So, um, basically, neurosurgery and becoming a neurosurgeon was the, 
was the most achieving experience for me so far. It's so nice. I mean, it, it's exactly the, the story is exactly the um, the reason why I started this podcast because uh, you told me that uh, during your high school, basically you had no idea what you're going to do. You said, okay, I'll go to medicine because based on some, let's say, objective criteria. Okay, you chose medicine. Yeah, I, I chose something useful, you know. Yes, not, but it not, not wasting the year. I for understand, nothing. but you didn't have that drive to say, oh, I want to do medicine since no, I, I was a I child. I wanted to be a so... doctor. No, I wanted to be a okay. doctor, you know, because, well, it gives you a certain prestige. It pays, um, and it's, it's so a clean job. Okay. And so rewarding. Yes, very it, rewarding. it's very rewarding. But at the same time, being a doctor is not the same thing with being a surgeon. Because... Detail a bit that... Yeah, okay, so I, I don't want to be um, judgmental. I don't want to discriminate. Everyone in this, everyone in this world is important. But b being... Being a doctor for me came out of inertia. Being uh -huh. a surgeon came out of passion. Oh, oh okay. Now, I, now it's crystal okay. clear. Okay. So, um, there's another point which had a great impact on me. Uh, the same period, the same three-week period of the first summer practice. I remember I uh, used to help out the guys with uh, patients during on-call periods. So th there was this Saturday about 2 a.m. and uh, the hospital received a transfer I think from Vaslui via helicopter. So there was this 22 year old male weighed about 120 kilos um, and the only thing I can remember about him, besides the surgery, <laughs> uh, he had a daughter, so he was three years older than I was, he had a daughter and he went bathing, um, in this river, mm -hmm. but he was unaware that underneath the surface of the water there was this giant concrete slab, so he jumped, hit his head against that concrete slab and completely shattered one of his cervical vertebrae Ooh. paralyzed from the neck down and so help me god I can still remember him telling the surgeon please just give me my hands back I have a daughter mm. and I, I was shocked I was in shock it was he, he was the first trauma victim I've ever seen and I said what is this guy gonna do He's 22 years old, he's 3 years older than I am, he already has a daughter and he will, he'll, he, will be unable, he will be unable to walk for the rest of his life. So that was the point when I, when I understood how important what we do is for the people around us. They're basically that man's god at that moment. Ah, yes, I know. You know? So everything he, as a human being, is, is clinging on to you for help. And I remember that they went into surgery as soon as possible. There was a complete mess of his vertebra, I don't know, 30, 20, 30 fragments or something. Um, it was the first time I've seen a, a heterograft with bone from his ilium. Um, they basically reconstructed part of his vertebra, they performed an anterior instrumentation and fixation. Rods and screws in the posterior. And he came back and he had his, his hands whole, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was it for me. <laughs> that was the confirmation? Yeah. I left that day the hospital thinking NASA were amateurs <laughs> and the only thing I remember besides the surgery and the patient and the sensation I had that what surgeons do what neurosurgeons do really matters I remember I went to the shop and bought a pen which I still have today it's one of my most uh, prized memories from uh, medical school a pen yeah a Parker pen a silver metal Parker pen I don't know if I paid 20 bucks for it or something. Okay. Yeah. 
but I still have it. It's bent, it's twisted, it's rusted, <laughs> but I still have it. So uh, yeah, that's how I became. That's how I became a, a neurosurgeon. I find it quite interesting that you are saying that um, during your summer practice you went to the hospital in the morning and the afternoon and the evening you were reading anatomy yeah. and learning it. And I think that's the uh, the definition of um, of finding your why. You knew exactly why you are doing this. You are finding, let's say, your passion. You are on your way to finding your passion. Yeah, and. Uh, I want to ask you that, uh, do you consider that, that doctor uh, your mentor? I consider him, I, I consider him one of my mentors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. Yes? Yes. Um, so, finding your way... I mean, the next, the, <coughs> the next question uh, now hearing your story was, how, in your opinion, how, how do you think that someone can can find their passion. I mean, there's no, there's no universal recipe, of course, but there are some, some things you can do uh, to, I, I don't know, expose to a lot of things and find mm, your passion because... No, it, I don't think so, no. Then? There is no recipe of success. Of course. So every self-motivating book, every motivate, motivational movie, every story you, you hear, they're not your story. Yeah. So to the guys hearing this, Success is not something you achieved. You achieve by doing something in particular. Finding your way isn't found in books. How to find your way? You don't. You don't do that. You just do it. You just pick a certain purpose and you strive towards it. Um, basically, the first thing you have to do is get up in the morning. Okay, don't sleep until 11. Don't sleep until 12. <laughs> I love this. Okay. okay. Just get out of bed. Do your, Make your bed. Get yourself a cup of coffee. And work towards achieving your goal. Whatever that one is. So you want to be a football player. Okay. Get out of bed. Make your bed. Grab your ball. Grab your sneakers. And go play football. Right. Until you can no longer play. <laughs> so, do you believe in this, uh, let's say, um, successful routines, like morning routines, evening routines, I don't know, things you do every day that... Uh... I think success comes from the mind itself. So, you, so it, you're, it, you're saying that success is a mindset? It's Yeah, success is a mindset. It's mind over body. Pain is temporary, glory lasts forever. So... I I watched this material a few days ago saying that, okay, um, you want to be rich. Well, how do you find wealth? Well, rich people are the upper 1%. So Mm -hmm. if you want to be part of the upper 1%, you have to be willing to put in more than the other 99. You want to be rich? Okay. You need to work harder than the rest. You need to stay up longer than the rest. You need to invest in this drive of yours more than the other 99%. And that's that's the only criteria you need. You know? Mm-hmm. Work, 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 work. Because if you have talent, you'll just die a, a hope. Yeah. Okay? I heard the guy saying a thing like... Um... Uh, reason reap results yeah fair enough uh, it, it really stuck in my mind uh, so basically you said that success is um, let's say um, a state of mind mindset right success is a state of mind mm, nice yeah because you need to understand the things you want everybody wants okay for example yourself mm-hmm. you're a medical student right so what is your purpose? Okay, uh, learning as much as possible and getting good scores in exams, okay? Right. But everybody wants that. Everybody wants good scores in exams. Everybody wants to be a good doctor. Everybody wants to learn as much as possible. The question is, what separates you from your colleagues? And the answer mm. is strive, yeah. determination, discipline. That's the key to success. 
Yeah, I uh, I I was listening to a lot of guys talking on these teams about let's say success, successful mindset and things like this, and I uh, I quite made for myself a definition of success, saying that uh, I truly believe that success is your willingness to fail at increasingly higher levels. Yes, because it's undoubted that you will fail. Of course. Everybody fails once, twice, three times. That's the point. Uh, the, the idea behind this is that the masters have failed more times than the learners ever tried. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what I say, I was saying. That competition is everywhere. Of course. Okay. Uh, at Harvard, at Yale, at Oxford, at uh, NASA, uh, in the army, in the police. Everybody has competitions. Of course. So in medicine, we're not the only ones. Oh, no. But I think the, the most important competition is with yourself. Knowing yourself and challenging yourself. Yep. Never stopping. So I didn't come this far to only get this far. Yeah, exactly. No, always set up a higher purpose. So, okay, I became a doctor. What next? Okay, let me become a surgeon. What next? Let me become a PhD fellow. What next? And so on. What next? Mm -hmm. What next? What next? Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with this. Now I have a question regarding your, your specialty. Why di did you choose to stay in Romania? Uh, good question. Well, basically, because, well, as the Germans say it, Everywhere you go, you're an Auslander. You're a stranger, a straniero, <laughs> a foreigner. Um, and secondly, because why not? Because it's, I don't know, it's easier to live. They have, they have let's say, better equipment, better conditions. and Yeah, but paradise doesn't exist on Earth. Okay, so if you go, choose a country. Just a country. Now? Yeah, right now. Give me one country. Uh, I don't know, Spain. Spain, okay. If you go in Spain, you will be a foreigner, first of all. Of course. You will be Romanian, second of all. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. And third, no surgeon there will say, okay, uh, I'm going to quit. You come here, get my job and do the living I do. Yeah. Okay? So, nothing comes free. In Romania, well, it's my country. My language, I'm not a foreigner, and basically I have everything I need to make it here. Hmm, that's nice. Uh, I know you you are a guest, as I said in the introduction, you're a guest in Germany at the Hanover yeah. University. And uh, I I was always thinking that I would feel more, um, more close to people here in this country. I mean, I would, I would feel a bit strange to treat people, foreign people, you see, and uh, speak with them in other language, I mean, it's, uh, you feel that, working with the patients? Uh, well, basically, it, it, uh, okay, okay, so basically, um, Germany has been an exceptional experience for me, so I, I, came, I came to work with intraoperative MRIs, mm. um, Basically, the INI Center in Hanover is the <clears throat> one of the most famous neurosurgical hospitals in Europe, if not the most famous. I worked there with great guys, great teachers, all having achieved legendary status in the neurosurgical meme. But the reason... I didn't see myself living and working in Germany was because the people there are very, very stone cold. <laughs> okay, so we're friends at work, we laugh, we drink our coffees, we work together, we work toward the same goals, but once the work is done, it's done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so their interhuman relations are, are worse than with Latin people, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could see myself living and working in Italy, for example. Uh -huh. Italy is a great country. Yeah, that's my feeling too. Basically, you're saying that you, when you were in Germany, what uh, happened but in hospital, ha stayed in hospital. Yeah, and that was it. 
So I was talking with this friend of mine and I said, if I stay here for three more weeks, I think I'm going to have a depression. <laughs> no, seriously, the, the weather was so cold and so changing. So in the morning there was sun, in the evening there was snow. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, basically, don't get me wrong, Germany is a great country. So they, they have this technology and this discipline and this common drive towards, you know, making a difference. But, you know, as a human being, besides being a doctor, you know, you need work, working with people. You need to have someone to talk with. Like, we're not alone. Yeah, you need social interactions. We're not alone. We're not robots. Yeah. Because... You know, Yet. I'm I'm going to say what a friend of mine said. So he's a professor of gynecology. And yeah, she said, "Listen here, you can be the best professional in the world if you're not a human being. You live for nothing." Yeah. You know. So I think this is the second part of your answer. What is the the recipe for success? You need to be able to intermix your work with your life perfectly mm -hmm. you know so okay having to this achieve great, a balance. Ha having this great job isn't everything you know because in the evening you go home like everyone else you need to have friends like anyone else you need to eat like anyone else you need to have a laugh you need to go to a party because not everything in this life is happening only at your job of course right. all right um now I'm going to ask you something about this outstanding article. I mean, I love it. I read it. I love Thanks. it. It's, it's quite impressive. You are talking about the the hidden uh, anatomy in Michelangelo's work. How how did you end up doing this? You know, uh, there's this Latin saying Latin saying that uh, luck favors a prepared mind. <laughs> so the idea behind this article is ancient. I was in my second year of med school, again, reading anatomy. And I was traveling by train to Bucharest. So the train trip takes about seven hours. It's Holy monstrous, shit. yeah. <laughs> and, um, well, I needed something to make time go by. So, as any other normal normal person I got my headphones my phone I was listening to music but you know you can only do that for some time afterwards yeah, you become bored I remember buying this album about Mike, Michelangelo's uh, works and at the same time I had an anatomy book with me and I was uh, was reading was preparing an exam and I was reading the uh, the midbrain and, you know, I was browsing the pages and looking at pictures and drawings and so on. And at, at some point, I was looking at the, the drawing and I was thinking like, dude, I, I've seen this before. Where did I see it? But I, I knew it wasn't anatomy. I knew it was something with, with works of art. And at that point, it hit me. Wait a minute. I know this. I've seen this in a painting. And that was it, basically. So it, it, it's, it, it just simply strike you? Yeah, it just struck me. You know, I, I was looking at this picture in my anatomy book and the next phase was looking at this picture in my uh, art album. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, no, this is too good to be, to be true. I need to <laughs> dig some more. So next, the next step was uh, asking, well, okay, Am I the only one seeing this? <laughs> because there are certain principles, the Gestalt laws of uh, anticipation say mm -hmm. that the mind is tempted to see what it wants. Yeah. But if you look at the pictures, you will see that, okay, the mind see yeah. does see what it wants, but, but it's, it's there. there. Yeah. <laughs> you can't deny it. I I've seen it, yeah. It's there. So obviously, uh, I did what any sensible student would do I went with it to to my professors and they said in the first phase okay you're crazy go home but the second phase was like wait can I see that again uh, 
it came as a shock to me as well because all of the, all of a sudden it made sense. I wasn't crazy. And the professor said, "How soon can you give me a paper on this?" I was like, "Give me a week." Gave me a week. He added extra ideas and we published it. Mm-hmm. Of course, the the effort took years because we both then hit ourselves against the same problems. Mm-hmm. Publishers saying you're both crazy. <laughs> course but in the end it turned out okay so it was a long journey but in the end after seeing your efforts published and our ideas we know that well it paid off it, yeah it's an idea yeah. it's it's very nice idea and it's it's kind of unique I mean I I told you I read it and it's it's quite amazing um, next I'd like to ask you um, What are the things you are most proud of? Oh, now this is a tricky question. Well, I am proud of not having criminal record. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm proud for for completing med school. I'm proud for being a neurosurgeon. Um, I'm proud for not having failed my parents' efforts. And basically, you know, I'm proud that what I do makes a makes a difference. Mm-hmm. What else? I'm proud to have saved lives. Um, that really counts on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm proud of being a nice guy, I suppose. Mm, okay. Because, you know... Um, I don't come from this rich family, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I'm proud of being able to stand on my own, of being able to pay my own bills. And... That's a challenge for us, basically for medical students. Yeah. To stay on your own feet. This, this was a great frustration for me, so... Yeah, you are not the only one. <laughs> on, a second, uh, on a second discussion, you know, hang in there. <laughs> Everything takes time, and good things never come cheap. Yeah, I know. It's it's a great effort for you guys, for medical students, for your parents. You have no idea what's in the mind of your parents, but trust me, at the end, they will be proud of you. It's it's every everything is just a click. Mm-hmm. Be patient; it will pass. Yeah, patience is pain. Something. Pain is temporary. Glory lasts forever. Yeah. Yeah, true, very true. But let's say if you could do something else, totally different from what you're doing now, let's say for, for 48 hours, what would you do? <laughs> uh, besides being president of the United States? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, I mean, you, you have 40... everyone could do that better than the current one. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so you have 48 hours, can do anything that crosses your mind. It's like a bucket list. I'd like to be a Navy SEAL. Oh. Yeah. Mm, nice. Mm. I mean, I, I'm very curious about the experience and about what makes them tick. But of course, it's all a, a, a matter of mind of her body and discipline and hard work. But I would like to get to experience that side of, of things. What else? I'd like to be a fighter pilot. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Tom Cruise, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but inverted. <laughs> okay. okay. And maybe a race car driver. No. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I can totally feel you here, yes. I I so much want to drive one of these machineries. Yeah, definitely. Mm, 300 and So, mm. I don't know, what would you like to be for 48 hours? For 48 hours, uh, that one, uh, an, uh, a Formula One driver, okay. totally. Um, I have an, an interesting passion for uh, uh, for cars, you know, and uh, I yeah, was... You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was always, um, uh, let's see, I, when I was a kid, I wanted to have a shop, you know, a small tuning shop. 
and uh, where I can... We, we, we've all played Need for Speed. <laughs> of course, but <laughs> I wanted to have this, um, this shop with only, uh, on which I can take only one car and do it myself. Only me. There okay. were no employees, just me doing that. And you see, n not that that kind of tuning like you see in Need for Speed. Uh, no, no, no. Tuning maybe maybe invisible, let's say, you see. Mm -hmm. But when you push that throttle, oh my God, the, the demons get out of that car. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, uh, besides medicine, and this this is true, I wanted to be uh, to be a fi uh, not a fighter, a uh, pilot. I wanted to be a pilot, but I had that issue with the wearing glasses, and I think that I was not going to pass the physical mm -hmm. examination, and I said, okay, now... Here's another thing that crossed my mind. For 48 hours, I would like to be an astronaut. Uh, yes. Reach space, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, what are the three, thi three things you, you would tell to the 20-year-old you? Wow. Just three. <laughs> study more. <laughs> okay. Study more. Study hard. Study smart, not hard. No, study hard. <laughs> okay. Trust me. Don't study smart. Study hard. Because, you know, in order to learn something, you need to learn it 100 times and forget 99 times. Yeah. And it's... This is so true. So, study hard. Study... Study strenuously. You know... Always go 100%, not 99, not 98, always go 100%. Never back down and I don't know. Oh, come on, Everything come on. is just a phase, you know? Yeah. Don't, don't, take, don't take life so personally. Just take everything the way life throws it at you. So every person has their personal failures, their deceptions, their, I don't know, doubts. But as soon as you learn how to master these, to overcome these periods, you'll see that life has, has, a, silver, has a silver lining. Mm -hmm. And this silver lining basically is the reason that everyone, you know, however harsh their situation might be, has this smile, you know, not always visible, but hidden in the corner of their mouth. So yeah, even though life is hard, because it is hard, that silver lining is the reason for which all of us should understand that the bad things come and go mm -hmm. but when you learn to see only the good things you know you your mindset will change yeah and i think yeah the, the life is hard but uh, i think our challenge is to make it to not make it harder and make it let's say a bit more simple and yeah. keep it so stay focused on your dreams and your goals absolutely and i think everything will come and my la my last question for you is what impact do you want to have I want to have the impact. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but, you know, define impact. Uh, let's see how, um, how your goal, your, your actions uh, materialize. Well, it's a tough question because, you know, ev everyone has their own definition of impact. As a doctor, I would have an easy way of answering this question. Okay, I want my patients to be okay, mm. my surgeries to go well, and you know everyone will, will be will be happy. But you know the impact, the impact you have on your society, on where you live, is more than being a good professional. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that. I would define impact by being able to do my best for my patients, to be able to teach my students things they would, you know, have difficulties in touching. Mm -hmm. For example, neurosurgery. Um, what else? Yeah, I'd like to have a family someday and, you know, have a good impact on their lives. Um, 
so basically I don't know what what the impact I would like to mm-hmm. have will be, but I want it to be positive, you know. Yeah. Right. So help everyone I can, help my patients, you know, have a good family, help my students, uh, help my colleagues, you know, be able to to be able to improve. I don't know why not the hospital. Yeah. Know? And I hope you'll uh, so, you'll help your students not only with the information. I mean, I think that's, I don't know, little talks, maybe something like this could really make an impact on them. Because, you know, techno- uh, we're you- doing it as we speak. <laughs> yes, I know. But uh, I now I'm, I'm looking I'm looking at our, I don't know, phones, tablets, laptops, I mean, hello, all the information there. Uh, I mean, our courses and things like this are becoming more and more redundant. I think we should make uh, our, let's say, our focus more on people, on humans, not so much on information because anyone has access to information right now. Yeah. Um, So I was looking at this rather sad material the other day about how some students claimed that, well, med school didn't help me out that much. Mm -hmm. I'm able to find all the info I need on the internet and you know learn it for myself and that's why med school doesn't help me so yeah maybe we should address that i think that you know a good teacher isn't the one that gives you here's the course it's 200 pages read it by tomorrow and then we'll have the exam so a good teacher is the guy that you know takes the time off to talk with you to find out what makes you tick, to help you understand things better. Mm-hmm. And a good teacher basically has to be some sort of pillar or landmark mm-hmm. for his students. It should. You know, someone who comes in there and says, you need to study more. Okay, you, you're not failing. You get decent grades, but you need to study more. Why? Because if you study more, you will be a good doctor. You know, someone who gives you this pep talks. Mm-hmm. Someone who, you know, you look towards like a father figure or a mother figure. And, you know, you have the liberty to go and talk with him and say, look, I don't think these things are working. You know, so, yeah, ev- everyone has their own schedule. Every surgeon is busy, every doctor is busy, but... Today everyone's busy. Yeah, everyone's busy today. But I think that, you know, the guys that actually count are those who say, okay, I'm busy, give me five minutes, let me finish my work and then we'll talk. Let's find out what, what, what we can do to change the, the situation for the better. Yeah, hope we'll see you like this. <laughs> I'm trying. Of course. So, man, thank you so much. It, it was... So it was incredible amazing uh thanks guys you'll uh, you'll enjoy thanks it. for having me <laughs> thank you for accepting my invitation uh see you at the next episode the podcast you just heard was made using anchor ever thought about making your own podcast anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.